on this computer. There we go. Okay. All right. So Sicily is pretty crazy. Um, you get back to there. Um, I'm just going to run through this quickly. So let's see. So it starts off. So Sicily, no one actually knows where people like the people, there were people on Sicily before, before the Greeks, before Greek civilization got there. There were a bunch of different tribes. No one knows where they came from. Um, but like I say in the handout here, they've found archaeological evidence going back to like the, um, the Bronze Age. And they've found like the back to the Neolithic Bronze Age on Sicily of people being there. And they've found uh, like artifacts that point to a bunch of different cultures. So uh, there is somebody who hasn't gotten the Zoom link yet. Um, let me send Matt Bollander the Zoom link. Um, anyway, let's see. So there uh, were, so they found like dolmen, which are, you know, like standing stones, like what you would, uh, like, like what you get in like France and England and stuff like that. Jeez. Uh, Let's see. Uh, but then they've also found archaeological evidence uh, that points to that that comes from like Eastern, like 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 near Asian cultures and stuff like that. Um, so Sicily has just always been this this melting pot. It seems like. Um, all right, there we go sent Matt the Zoom link. Uh, so that's before the Greeks. So then Greek civilization comes to Sicily in, I don't know when, I didn't put it on here, but there was a period where there was like a like extended like many year drought in Greece. And it like pushed a lot of, you know, people to go look around, look for places where they could live, where there was not, a drought. Um, and so Greek settlers started coming to Eastern Sicily and Sicily, Sicily even back then was a really like fertile, like, like agriculturally rich place. Um, and so more Greek uh, settlers started coming and they founded cities like Syracuse or Syracuse, Naxos. They founded a whole bunch of Greek like city states along the east side of the island and then like slowly started moving inland. And at first they fought with the indigenous tribes that were there, but then they they actually just sort of like combined and you know like all like the the local people absorbed Greek culture and the Greeks picked up Sicilian culture and they all sort of just like mixed together and intermarried anyway. Um, so Sicily was like like Syracuse, who oh man, I forget who it is, but Syracuse, like Syracuse, and a bunch of the the Sicilian Greek city states were were very prosperous and were some of the like richest, most powerful city states, like important city states in in like Greek civilization. Um, Mount Etna is in legend. Mount Et Mount Etna is actually the birthplace of Dionysus. Also, very important. To know so um mountain dionysus was supposed to have been born dionysus was the son of zeus and a mortal woman i forget her name uh but anyway uh she conceived a child with zeus and then hera tricked her into you know making zeus reveal his true form to her and when zeus you know like revealed his his true form it you know burned her to death and stuff and but zeus managed to save the the baby uh baby dionysus and brought up by um naiads or something on the side of mount etna so uh there we go so uh dionysus born on the slopes of mount etna uh roman period Sicily was the Romans' first conquest, basically. Like, 
outs like the the Romans expanded, slowly conquered the Italian peninsula, and then Sicily. Even then, the Romans were buying a lot of grain from Sicily. Sicily was like Rome's breadbasket, um, but the Romans didn't actually control Sicily. They were just buying a lot of grain from the Sicilians and were sort of like started to get worried about that. And at the same time, there were incursions sort of like into Sicily by the Carthaginians. And so the Romans decided to go and, um, you know, and conquer Sicily. They were like, we need, we need to control the place where all of our food is coming from. So the Romans started the, the start of the first Punic War, which, you know, led to the whole war with Carthage and Hannibal. And eventually, I don't know how long that was, like 150 years later, the Romans finally conquering Carthage and raising it to the ground and plowing salt into the fields and everything. All of that started when the Romans decided that they needed to conquer Sicily. That was the kickoff of the Punic Wars. And so the Romans conquered Sicily and it became the Romans' first like province, their first sort of like overseas conquest that became a part of the Roman Empire, but it was still apart from the Roman Empire. Um, and then the Romans, as the Romans took over, the Romans put a lot of time and attention to detail and, and general investment into increasing the agricultural production of the island. Um, and they standardized a lot of like weights and measures and a tax system and reporting of production and uh, like transport and everything, um, primarily for producing grain for Rome. Like, like I said, Sicily was Rome's breadbasket. Sicily, Rome could not feed itself. It came from, um, from Sicily. Um, it was, then it was conquered. So then Rome slowly declined uh, way, you know, way in the future, it took a long time, but Rome slowly declined. Uh, the Vandals conquered Sicily and were sort of players in Sicily for a while. Then the Byzantines, the Eastern Roman Empire conquered Sicily and actually moved the capital from Constantinople to Syracuse for a little while. Then the Muslims came and conquered Sicily. And actually how that happened, funny story, there was a uh, Byzantine admiral. I don't think he was a general. We'll call him a general because they were probably all generals back then. He decided he wanted to marry a nun and like forced her into marriage with him. And when the whatever the, whatever, I don't know, emperor of the Holy, of the Eastern, of the Byzantine Empire, of the Eastern Roman Empire heard about this, um, or the, the, like, administrator of Sicily, they expelled him, and he was all bitter about it, and so he went to T Tunisia, which is right there, Tunisia, like, southern Sicily is actually further south than the northern edge of Tunisia, so Sicily is actually, like, right there, on a line with Africa. So I forget his name now, but this, this stupid Byzantine general went to Northern Africa and requ requested help from the Emirate there. And so they actually, they were like, oh, this is a great opportunity for us to go conquer Sicily. And so the, um, the Muslims that were there in Northern Africa sent an army of Berbers and stuff, just like they did with Spain across the Sicily. And it took like a hundred year, 90 years, something like that, but they slowly conquered all of Sicily, uh, but they didn't really rule it for all of that long. They were there for like a few a hundred years, something like that, before um, Viking, the Vikings came and started attacking Sicily. At first, it was just Viking raids coming, you know, like down around the coast of Europe and then in through the Mediterranean. Um, but, oh boy, let's see. It was the early early 10 hundreds started out with like actual vikings but then you know so the normans were vikings who had i think a lot of primarily norwegians because the the swedes went down through the rivers and like through russia but the norwegians and the danes 
uh, were the ones who were primarily in on the like Atlantic coast of Western Europe. So the Normans, you know, were Vikings who had settled on the Atlantic coast of France. Uh, in the like early mid 10 hundreds, there was this family of Norman knights, the de Hautevilles, who like they had a small estate in Normandy and whatever the paid father was, he had a bunch of sons and it was too small an estate for all of his sons. So they couldn't stay there. There wasn't enough land, you know, they had no future staying there. So like, what do you do? Well, you're a Viking, you go traveling, you go, you know, like go look for where you're gonna go for something, look, find something else. Um, so there were a whole bunch of de Hauteville brothers and uh, the first of them, Robert, Robert Giscard, meaning the, the clever, uh, Robert the Clever, came down through the Mediterranean, came to Southern Italy to um, Calabria and started working as a mercenary for a bunch of, at that point, Southern Italy was, parts of it were controlled by like Byzant Byzantines, people from the Byzantine Empire had like little forts and stuff like that. There were also like little pockets of like forts like the like Muslims from North Africa and then you also had like Italian nobles who sort of kind of had some allegiance a lot to the uh the Pope in Rome but it was this whole like southern Italy was this whole mixed up little like warring city-states and stuff like that so the the Dodeville brothers come in and at first they're like oh we'll help you out we're mercenaries you know and people start hiring them to fight for them but pretty quickly the Normans, these Vikings, they're like, boy, really nice land you got here. Be a shame if someone came along and took it. Actually, we're going to take that castle. This is ours now. And so the Dodeville brothers start conquering southern Italy. And just like they start rolling up like, you know, town by town. Uh, the Pope, I forget the, which Pope it was. It might have been Clement the something. He actually came down with an army of German mercenaries to try and beat them. And the Normans actually beat, beat them, routed the Swabians, uh, took the Pope hostage, apologized, said they were good Catholics and they really hated to do this. And they, they wished that the Pope hadn't made them do this. And finally they got the Pope to forgive them and recognize them as like local lords in Southern Italy. And so, like Ro uh, Robert Giscard is the first who does this, but then more and more of the Dodeville brothers start coming down to join him because he's like, "Hey, hey, guys, come, come, come down here! I've got a, I'm, I'm a lord now." And um, one of his brothers, Roger the first, comes down, and so they're like slowly conquering more of southern Italy. And the next pope, you know, knows what happened to the previous pope about how they took him hostage and everything, and he starts getting worried. And so he's like, hey, um, you de Hauteville brothers, you know, Sicily over there? That's a really nice place over there. Too bad it's full of Muslims. Hey, if you guys conquer it, it's yours. If you conquer Sicily for me, you can have it. You can be king of Sicily. And so the Normans are like, all right, great. And so they sail over to Sicily and invade Sicily. And um, Vikings had been raiding Sicily, but now the, the Dodeville brothers go for it in earnest. Um, and including, they bring along with them the Varangian Guard, uh, which were a bunch of famous Vikings who specifically were hired by the Byzantines. They were, guard, they were bodyguards to the uh, emperor of Byzantium. They were involved, uh, including um, Harald Hardrada, the future king of Norway. Uh, anyway, it took them like, I forget, 90 years, something like that again, but slowly, uh, no, it was less than that. Something like 30-ish years, I think. And the Dodeville brothers managed to conquer Sicily. So there was Roger the um, first who, like who was who actually conquered Sicily and became like the Duke of Sicily, and then his son Roger II was king of Sicily, and he was king of like Sicily and southern Italy of like of Calabria and stuff like that. Um, and it was actually it became a very like multicultural, very wealthy state um, because the Normans 
the Normans didn't really care a whole lot about like re what particular religion people were or anything like that. And under the Muslims, uh, the Muslims were very accepting of the other Abrahamic religions. So like Jews and Christians were fine to continue living in Sicily and like worshiping on their own and stuff like that. And the Normans didn't really want to change that. The Normans just wanted to be in charge. So the Normans were like, fine, cool. You get everybody, you keep on doing what you're doing. Um, eventually, uh, the male line from Roger the first died out and by a uh, great, great granddaughter of his, it passed into the uh, Hohenstaufen aristocracy, a German noble house from Swabia. Um, but they were still descendants from Roger the first because it was uh, through through marriage. It was, you know, uh, the I forget I forget her name, but it was like a great, great, great granddaughter or great, great granddaughter of um, uh, Roger the first. She married into the Hohenstaufens and then her son became Frederick the second of Sicily. And he built one of Europe's first universities. Um, he it might have been one of the very first like really accurate maps of what at that point was the known world, but he uh, commissioned a famous Muslim cartographer to create a map of basically all of Europe um, with Sicily right in the, <laughs> in the center of it. But this, this incredibly complicated, like a, a very accurate detailed map of like uh, the Middle East, Northern Africa, Europe and everything. Um, partially to like have like Sicily, the kingdom of Sicily right in the center, but also so that the, the, the Normans could be like, all right, where else are we gonna go conquer now? Uh, they actually went and conquered Antioch uh, during the Crusades and the kingdom of, uh, kingdom of Antioch was another Norman king, another, another one of the Dohoedville Do brothers. The Dohoedville brothers conquered like Southern Italy, Sicily, a bunch of the Middle East, like they got all over the place. Um, Let's see. Uh, and, and through this, like Sicily became one of the most powerful and wealthy states in Europe because it was right in the center of all of these trade routes. Uh, everybody going from the rest of Europe or uh, Western Africa, going to the Middle East, go, uh, going back and forth and anything you wanted to move like gold, spices, slaves, uh, metalwork, anything, you know, generally it sort of had to pass around or through Sicily. So Sicily was really rich. Um, interesting and sort of important, even back then, even going back to the Romans, Sicily was an agricultural power producing food for other places. So you had large estates in Sicily growing grain, producing all, all kinds of food, um, producing wine, but specifically producing it for export to the rest of Italy, um, to Northern Africa, like over to Egypt, stuff like that. So Sicily had this history of large like estates, large land holdings that were run, that were owned by a family or run by like one person. Um, and it was, it was basically the feudal system, but it was sort of stronger than in other parts of Italy or other parts of Europe, like places like, I don't know, like Piedmont and stuff like that, where you had more of like a middle class and there was other, there were other stuff, other, like there were, you had, you had more like small farmers and artisans and stuff like that. Like Sicily had tons of artisans and Sicily was relatively speaking highly educated. But in a lot of Sicily, you had this like large scale sort of industrial like agriculture even way back then. And that kept on going. Um, another sort of important historical thing to talk about is the Napoleonic Wars. Um, Napoleon invaded Italy, came down to the peninsula. And, you know, the Napoleonic Wars are basically a history of the conflict between Napoleon and his armies and his like ability to dominate the land and the British Navy and the British Navy's ability to just completely dominate everywhere there where there was enough water for them to sail warships. So the British Navy um, 
you know, wanted to continue to control the Mediterranean and oppose Napoleon. And so when Napoleon was coming down the Italian peninsula, the British Navy, the British came and said like, hey, Bourbon, king and queen in Naples, because Southern Italy was still its own kingdom, kingdom of Naples and Sicily. Um, the British Navy came and helped evacuate the Bourbon uh, king and aristocracy from Naples to Sicily. And then the British Navy blockaded all the ports in Southern Italy so that Napoleon couldn't get across to Sicily. Um, and the British sent you know, administrators and troops and stuff to Sicily to fortify Sicily and maintain Sicily as an independent um, state resisting Napoleon and maintain it as a base of operations for their Navy and also as a basically a supply depot. Um, so Sicily got really rich during the Napoleonic Wars, producing all kinds of food from pistachios to, you know, dates to grain to raising goats and cattle and producing all of this stuff to supply the British Navy and being like the primary place producing food and meat and everything for like the entire British naval operation throughout the entire Mediterranean. Um, so they were like, like new ports were built. It was, it was a massive undertaking and Sicily continued to do very well and be pretty rich because of all of that. Um, and that continued to perpetuate the like industrial mass, like agriculture sort of that, that was there. Um, after the, the Napoleonic Wars, then you had the resurgiment, the Sicily continued exporting after that. Um, but then you had the Risorgimento when um, Garibaldi, Garibaldi was a mercenary. He was an Italian mercenary who had fought all over the place in like Northern Italy. He'd fought in wars in South America. He fought in like a failed upper revolution in Brazil. Um, he was hired by a bunch of Italian nobles. I don't even completely understand like how it originally happened, but he was hired uh, basically to get rid of a bunch of the existing nobles, a bunch of like the Bourbon aristocracy. And so uh, Garibaldi went to Sardinia first and led an uprising on Sardinia. Then he came over to Sicily and the real, the plan was to conquer Naples, but he came to Sicily first because Sicily was less well defended. Uh, he wanted to use it as like a jumping off point. So Garibaldi came to Sicily, um, led an uprising on Sicily and a lot of the pet, like a lot of people sort of just up, rose up, joined Garibaldi. Um, Garibaldi conquered Sicily, named himself dictator of Sicily and then like gathered all the, the men, all the people he could and went across to the Italian mainland and um, conquered Naples and, you know, and then the story goes on and he united Italy and created like the modern, start of the Italian modern, modern Italian state. Um, but when he did that, uh, in doing that, he conscripted a lot of the, like all the men who were of like fighting age um, in Sicily. And so he, sort of devastated the agricultural industry in Sicily because there just weren't like people around to farm and, and do stuff. And he also, you know, like a lot of the market for the food that Sicily was producing at that time was the rest of Italy. And then there was a war there. So there was no market and there was no way to get food and produce out. So um, the Risorgimento was not so great for Italy uh, then you know, eventually things came back together and Sicily continued on um, developing into what it is now. Uh, but Sicily, so Sicily has always been, Sicily is is Italian, it's a part of Italy, but it's a part apart from Italy. It is, it's semi-autonomous. It definitely has its own culture. Like, you know, they have their own dialect. A lot of people speak Italian, Italian now, but uh, still a lot of people like growing up when they're kids, like at home, they speak Sicilian dialect. Um, 
it's uh it's a very different unique place like it doesn't when you're there it does not feel like you're just in italy it is it's mediterranean but it's it's different it does not just feel like um like italy it's 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 a different place on to more winemaking um all of that sort of matters because it's, it's culturally it, it sort of determines a lot of this um and it, and it has had a it has an impact on how sicily you know went about producing wine and um consuming wine and everything um it's you know it's mediterranean it's hot it's it's warm the winters are not particularly cold they're warm wet winters the summers are pretty hot but uh in different parts of the island are very different and i'm gonna see all right we're gonna try and get into screen share here uh, um, need to remove that and then Screen share. Here's this convenient map of Italy. Um, so you have Mount Etna right here, Catania, um, Taormina up here, which is an old, old Greek city, Syracuse down there. Um, particularly over here in the west and the, the southern west, uh, gets really hot. Um, you can sort of see down here. So there's Sic there's all of Italy, Sicily, and then you have Tunisia right over there. So Tunisia is like down off out over here. Um, but you get winds from Northern Africa coming across and like Marsala over here uh, and Alcamo, the Alcamo Valley. Um, this is all, this gets really hot and dry in the summer also sort of like down here um but then when you get up here there's the nebrodi mountain range up here um and so on the uh the north side of this that's blocked from the winds from africa and that's all a lot cooler that's like cooler rainier um very it's also relatively cool and rainy over here on the east coast in the interior of the island, it's uh, colder in the winter, still really hot and dry and sunny in the summer. Um, because a lot of that, this is all, it's all so mountainous that a lot of this is like relatively protected from the, uh, from influence off of the, the ocean. So um, it's, it's, you can't really just make like big broad generalizations about Sicily and say like, oh, Sicily is like this or that cl climate wise. And also geologically, um, I should probably go back to that. Uh, geologically, Sicily uh, you have a lot of, like a lot of this is um, so Mount, Mount Etna is the largest and most active volcano in Europe. Um, you know, if, if you've, you may have seen pictures, Etna is currently erupting. It's one of the most active eruptions I think Etna has had in several, you know, in a while, like, I don't know, 10, 20 years. Um, but like, I'm seeing videos from wineries that I work with of, you know, an, of, of an eruption that's like a kilometer away from them right now, where from a kilometer away, you can see lava flying through the air. Um, like people on the outskirts of Etna, like there's, it's not just ash falling from the sky right now. It's like, there are rocks the size of golf balls falling out of the, out of the sky. Um, so, so Mount Etna is a very active volcano. And then also like up here in the Nebrodi range, there's a lot of volcanic material. The Stromboli Islands up here, uh, these are all the tops of volcanoes sticking out of the ocean. So there's a fair amount of volcanic material. Then when you get down into like here, the Southeast and the Southwest, that's more sort of like sedimentary, like former seabed, a lot of limestone, stuff like that over there. Um, but a lot of it, there's not, 
there's not a lot of like really f- like flat flat land in Sicily. A lot of it is is relatively hilly. There are flat places down there in the southeast and like some places in the interior, but but it's a pretty mountainous place. And anywhere that you have a lot of mountains, you end up with interesting places to uh, grow grapes and make wine. Um, Sicily is, I believe it's landmass wise, it's the largest province in Italy. And I think it's also the single largest economy. I forget whether at this point it's the largest provincial economy or it's in like, it's like the top three, something like that. But Sicily, just because of Sicily's size and population, even though Sicily compared to the rest of Italy, Sicily is relatively like underdeveloped. The infrastructure there is not great. Um, like talking about like roads and like utilities, stuff like that. It's, it's not particularly great compared to like Northern Italy. Um, but it's a big place with a lot of people. Um, so Sicily is, uh, has, has one of the largest economies in Italy. Uh, I'm going to, let's jump into wine now. So first up is this Grio. Piano Grio. So this is from the southeast. Grio is a grape variety that I am, I don't know, I feel like a lot of the time, a lot of Grio that I have, it's usually kind of like lacking in acidity. Um, so I'm usually not a huge fan of Grio, but uh, but I do really like this one. Um, and yeah, let's see. So I'm gonna go back to screen share, and then I am going to jump over here to. Uh, so this is the this is the owner winemaker. That's Lorenzo from Piano Grio. Um, I went and visited him in autumn of 2019. And I was in Sicily, no, whoops, that's not what I want. I was in Sicily uh, back in 2016 too. And I actually ran right through here. So he is uh, right down here outside of Vittoria. So I want to say he's like right up here in like this this sort of area, um, sort of above Vittoria. So it's pretty close to the ocean. There's definitely an oceanic influence to it. Um, let me get back to more pictures. I just scroll through. Um, that's part of his house. That is a, um, a church. I don't know when that dates back to, but that's a little church that dates back of several hundred years. The Sicilian wedding cart that he had kicking around in his house. And then, so I was there and we were walking around. He was like, Oh, look at this. And he opened up this cabinet and he was like, these are a bunch of Greek like artifacts that we found in the fields here over the years. Cause his his family has been here for like a thousand years. His family, uh, they were like local nobles that lived here. It's on top of a ridge, the Piano Grio like ridge. Um, his house originally was like a little medieval fortress and watchtower watching out for um, Berber and Byzantine pirates. Um, so these are things that they had just dug up or they had found in the fields working on the farm. Um, that just kind of blew my mind. Like that that looked more like it's Persian. And then uh, there's a Greek urn of some guy vomiting into something, someone else holding his head. Here's an urn with a satyr carrying a wine bag and a big erect penis riding on a dolphin. I love Greek art. It's great. So anyway. Um, yeah, Lorenzo Piano Grio. Uh, this is soil with a lot of limestone in it and pretty high elevation, like exposed to the wind. Uh, he farms organically. And actually, I should go back to 
this because I've got, here we go. Here are pictures of his vineyards. You can actually see, so you can see this like that, that soil there, this like white limestone. Where's a good picture? For I did not remember that he realized that he had so many of these pictures, Jesus. There we go. All right, so that's classic. Like this is up on top of the ridge. It's this like pale white calcareous sort of like limestone rich soil. And a lot of the vines are trained. This is the old traditional way of training them, Alberello, where they're not trained up on like a geo wire system or something like that. They just grow up stakes in the ground. Uh, 480 meters above sea level. So it's above a thousand feet. So it's, it's pretty exposed. It's still, it's, it's warm, it's sunny, but, um, but it's not as hot as you would expect it might be. It has tropical fruit to it, but it's tropical fruit. It's ripe, but it's also got like nice acidity. It's kind of like zippy and citrusy. It reminds me a little bit of like, like gooseberry and kiwi and stuff like that. It smells, like I smell like white wild flowers, but I also, it smells a little bit salty. It smells a little briny. Definitely makes me think of the ocean. Yeah, I love the salt and the finish of it. All right. Moving on. So next up, this is Gabriel Bini Zabibo. I'm sorry, Clementina. I'm sorry that you didn't get any. Zabibo um, This, uh, so let's see. So Gabriel Bini, I think I've got pictures of him here. There we go, Saragia. Here's a picture of him. I, oh man, somewhere he sent me a uh, a picture just the other day of um, some new amphora that he had that were out in the vineyard. Anyway, so this is this is Zabibo. Zabibo is um, genetically it's Muscat de Alejandria um, from uh, which is you know like the same same grape variety that we had when we were tasting the wines from uh, Southern Chile, the Naranja, like those, those skin contact muscats. So genetically, this is the same thing. It's not really exactly this. You, you can't say it's exactly the same because like these are old vines that have been propagated through moss all selection and stuff. And so they've sort of adapted to where they are. So it's, it's different from the muscat that you find other places, but um, muscat, and Muscat d'Alexandria, like there, it's a grape variety that's been grown. It's one of the, one of the oldest domesticated grape varieties, they think, because this you can make wine from it. It is a Vitis vinifera grape, but um, you can also eat it as a table grape. Like it's not too acidic. It doesn't have. It's not bitter. It doesn't have a like tannin and stuff like that. It um, it's a very like aromatic, pretty grape variety. Uh, Gabriel Bini was a architect in Milan and then he sort of retired, decided he didn't want to be an architect anymore. He wanted to be a winemaker. So he bought this little old estate on the Isle of Pantelleria. And Pantelleria is a hundred kilometers Southwest of Sicily, closer to Tunisia. So it's off the coast of Africa. It's this little 15 kilometer long island that is famous for its capers and for its uh, for wine, it's famous actually for sweet wine, primarily made from Zabibo. Uh, so this though here is totally dry. Um, this comes from 60 year old vines. 
at one of the highest points on the island. So they're, they're like higher elevation, again, windy, cooler. Um, he farms organically. He, I mean, he farms very, very naturally, uh, hand harvests. He doesn't use any like tractors in the vineyards. Everything's done by hand or with horses. Um, gets 20 days on the skins for initial fermentation in amphora. And then he racks it and lets it age for a further three months in huge amphora, like like 3,000 liter amphoras, like big, big, big guys um, that are actually outside. He just has them buried in the vineyards, like among the vines. So they're amphora that are just outside, buried among the vines, lets it age in them, and then it's bottled unfiltered and unfined. Um, this is in the neighborhood of like a hundred dollars a bottle retail. Um, it's, I've actually, I've only ever gotten one case of this. That's all I've ever gotten. Um, but I had three bottles left over. And so I was like, ah, screw it. I'll, I'll use it for a wine seminar. That'll be, <laughs> that'll be fun. And the only other time that I've tasted this was when I was on Mount Etna back at the end of 2019, and I was at this wine bar on the side of Mount Etna, Cave Ox, it's this famous wine bar. And the owner was like, hey, you can drink, you can drink anything. I'll open anything you wanna, you wanna open. What do you wanna drink? And I was so drunk already, and I had no idea really what I was doing. And I didn't even wanna get up from the, the, where I was sitting because I was so drunk. And so this other sommelier who was there from like Milan or somewhere was like, oh, I'll, I'll go, I'll go find something. I'll go pick something cool. And he went into the wine cave and he came back with this. I think it was actually this vintage. It was this wine. I think it was this vintage that we're drinking. Um, and I remember tasting it, but I was just so drunk that I was like this, you know, it, obviously it smells and tastes like Zabibo. It's aromatic. It's like Muscat and stuff, but I, I just, I couldn't. I could not even because I was so drunk and tasting it now though. I'm like, Holy crap. This wine is crazy. Um, because like I, like I said before with Muscat, I think when we were tasting those like skin contact Muscats from Southern Chile, um, Muscat does not have a lot of acidity to it. Um, and that's why it's not often made as a still wine like this. It's usually fortified. It's one of the wines that goes into Marsala which is a, you know, oxidative fortified wine from, um, from Western Sicily that we're not going to drink today because it's very hard to get good Marsala and good Marsala is really expensive. Uh, I get the best Marsala that there is from Marco di Bortoli. It's just extremely hard to get and expensive. And I didn't actually have any on hand right now to use for the seminar. Otherwise I would have, but, uh, next best thing, drinking this, drinking Zabibo. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so this just, this is, it's perfumed, it's aromatic, it smells like flowers, it smells like pineapple, it smells like ripe, vivid, beautiful, like really ripe apricots off of the tree. Are you trying to unmute yourself, Kelly? No, oh, okay, all right, I wasn't sure if you were just trying to unmute yourself because I mean, yeah, okay. It just, <clears throat> this wine just blows me away. And then drinking it, the finish is so salty. The finish is so, so salty. Um, yeah, it's, yes, animalistic, it's crazy. Um, like it has this tropical fruit. What it actually reminds me of um, is, like it's it's like ripe, rich tropical fruit, but it also is. It reminds me of of years ago, like a friend and I were like grilling steaks on this like wood wood fired grill, and we had a really ripe honeydew melon melon and sliced that up and threw that on the fire too, and just like charred it over the wood fire. And this wine reminds me of that. It's this like meaty, like roasted, like ripe, rich, honeyed, but like rustic wild sort of flavor i like it it's quite good glad i opened this um this is also this is 2018 and you know current release now is 2019 so this is like this is a little bit older 
And I wouldn't be surprised if like when this was younger, it might have been a little bit higher toned. And now that it's a little bit older, it might be like that might be why it's a little tiny bit more savory and a little bit more animalistic and stuff like that. Like it's not falling apart to, to my palate. It's just it's getting more like savory. It's it's it tastes like I would expect something like this to taste as it gets older and just sort of evolves. Man, crazy. All right. Uh, Cantina Barbera, Marlena Barbera from uh, Menfi, which is in the south, but over in the west. And I was looking around and I've actually known these wines, uh, Cantina Barbera for a while. Um, I actually saw them when I was in on Sicily the first time back in 2016. Here is, here's a picture of the vineyard. So that like, that is classic Sicily, like, like Sicilian farming, like there's the ocean right over there, you know, and you've got hills coming up away from the ocean more inland. And then you've just got this like, like pretty much flat, like down here by the coast, like just, you know, like agriculture, like, like her vineyards are here, but like, I, those are olive trees. Like, you know, there's, there's more olive trees over there, more agriculture. Um, and it's this, this like pale, dry, sandy soil. Uh, Bellicello is the, the name of the estate. And oh, yeah, and she's got these great pictures. Um, I believe where this is coming from, this is Narodavola, and I believe this is more similar to this soil over here in the east that's more like deep soil but ca like calcareous and it's got like rocks from the ocean and stuff like that because this whole part of Sicily was all underwater uh there so it's over here there's Menfi so this is right over here by Menfi over here right right on the coast Very pretty, kind of strawberry, very clean. It's Narodavola, which um, Narodavola is a pretty, like, juicy, ripe red grape, usually. Oh, fresh baked hala, yeah. Um, it, uh, Narodavola is like a fuller bodied red grape, but uh, this is direct press. Like, she's harvesting these grapes and she harvests at night to try and make sure that they're as cool as possible and that so that there is therefore like less oxidization. Um, and then this is direct press. There's no actual skin contact here. So all of the color that the wine has got, that's like just what it picked up from the, the initial like gentle pressing. And then it, uh, it ferments and is aged in stainless steel. Yeah, that like rich, fresh baked hala. And then also it's a it's an aroma. Yeah, I've lost it now. It smells citrusy, but there's also this like uh this like aroma that's like watermelony to me that I've gotten from like some other like roses like this before. It's fresh and has nice acidity, which must be really hard to do when you're in such a like hot, dry, sunny place, like where these grapes come from. 
Um, I've always been impressed by uh, Marlena Barbera's wines. Uh, yeah, that was 2019. Yeah. Twenty twenty, I think should be here relatively soon. I'm looking forward to it. All right, on to the first red wine. This is Piano Grio. This is a Cherisuolo di Vittoria. So back to Piano Grio. So down in the southeast again. Um, I would have included wine from. Um, Ariana Occupinti, if I like had any really kicking around, but I don't have enough of any one wine. I just have like odd bottles that I've held on to. Um, but when Ariana Occupinti started out making wine before she had really had vineyards of her own, she was buying grapes from different places and she was actually buying grapes from Lorenzo from some of these vineyards here. And then, um, he decided to start making wine on his own. I, so talking about Lorenzo here, um, you know, so his family has been here for a thousand years. Um, where's that picture? I'll get back to there's Lorenzo smiling there. So the thing is like, does Lorenzo really look Sicilian? His family is Sicilian, but does he really look Sicilian? He actually grew up in Milan. Um, his family has like a hundred hectares. His family actually has like quite a large estate here. Um, and they, uh, they make the most famous olive oil in Sicily. I've actually got an empty bottle here. This is actually a bottle that he gave me here at the, uh, at the winery. Piano Grio, uh, Patricella, Patricella Trentaquattro. Um, so what he actually does, most of their land is, uh, is old olive trees and he produces this really fantastic olive oil. It's all organic, you know, and he has like, uh, indigenous organic pigs that he raises there and stuff like that. But he, they had vineyards and his family had never really made wine. They'd just been selling the grapes off. And then he decided to start making wine as well. So he converted like this little barn on their property to being a winery and started making wine. So he's still making wine on like a very small scale. Um, but, you know, it is the overall, <clears throat> because he has this, this olive oil operation, it's a relatively large, large operation. Um, you can see more of that calcareous clay soil there. So this is a blend of 50-50, um, Neridavola and Frappato. Actually, I'll see if I can find the uh, description of this wine in particular here. So Cherisuola di Vittoria is actually a, uh, a DOCG. Uh, it has to be a blend of um, Let's see, wine has to be a blend of Frappato and Nero Davola. There it is, Curva Minore. Um, 8,000 bottles total production. Wow, there's some of that limestone there. There's Lorenzo in the vineyard. None of this is actually really anything particularly new. Oh, this is about all the wines. Anyway, uh, this is 2018. So it's Nero Davila, which sort of gives it more like more body and more like dark, powerful fruit. And then Frappato is really like pretty aromatic, like more sort of like raspberry perfume. 
This is equal parts, and this spends some time in barrel. Uh, I want to. I remember. I want to say it's not a year. It's something like eight months or something like that that this spends in barrel. I think Lorenzo. Fra, so Frappato Neridavola is grown all over Sicily. Um, Frappato, though, is really just grown down here in the southeast, down around Vittoria and Ragusa. And it's not particularly, I mean, it's, it's, it's not particularly common. It's definitely not common outside of that area. Um, it doesn't have the like best reputation. A lot of people even there sort of think of Frappato as being this like light, simple, easy drinking, like just drink it when it's young sort of wine, um, which, I mean, it is a lighter wine, a lighter grape variety wine than Nero Davila is. But Frappato can be extremely expressive and it can have a lot of like minerality and it preserves its acidity well and stuff like that. So it's sort of like people have written Frappato off because it's not big and powerful. But once you sort of like get beyond that and realize that wines don't have to be big and heavy and powerful in order to be like interesting and good, um, you can actually make really cool, exciting, expressive wines from Frappato. And I think like people in this part of Sicily are just sort of starting to come around to that. And um, I think we are going to, all right. <clears throat> Uh, we, I was going to say, I think we are going to start seeing more like really interesting, serious frappados. And I can say that actually as a fact, because I'm going to start bringing more interesting, exciting, serious frappados in to Maine and selling them around Maine. So at least here in Maine, you can take that as a fact. The world out there at large in general, I don't know about them so much, but at least here in Maine, um, <clears throat> there are more and more exciting frappados coming. But from talking to Lorenzo and talking to other people down here, they were uh, from a bunch of people, I sort of heard like, yeah, frappato. Like, I really like frappato. I'm gonna do more stuff with frappato and things. It smells a little bit smoky and like roasted. And I think that's a combination. That's the interplay of the like ripeness of the Nerodopola and then aging in barrel and like what that sort of does to it and what that brings out of the Nerodopola. makes it a tiny bit like gamey, a tiny bit reductive. I also gets it's in, in like, it's like a cedar wood smelling kind of thing. And then it also, I get like a, like a black cherry kind of aroma to it. It's a little bit of sort of cooked fruit, um, like cooked cherry, raspberry. The frappato is in there and gives it more acidity and more brightness. Yeah, leathery, leathery cannabis. I've never had leathery cannabis, but, but leathery definitely it definitely has like a little bit of a leathery thing to it. That definitely comes, I think, partially from the barrel aging. Um, they don't come into America, I don't think, but when I was there, Lorenzo, so Lorenzo also makes 100% Frappato and 100% Nerodavola and tasting them uh, side by side, Lorenzo was also barrel aging the Frappato, which I thought was a little bit weird. And it gave some of that same like, like cooked, like dried fruit thing to the frappato, which was sort of interesting, sort of unusual. But let's go on to wine number five, because this is La Maresca, this is a very similar blend. This is also Nerodavola and Frappato. 
from pretty close by. This is uh, from San Michele di Gonzaria, which is a little town. Uh, boy, I'm trying to remember. It was like a 40 minute drive from La Maresca over to Lorenzo's there, over to Piano Grio. Um, hop over to here. Made by this guy, made by Filippo. So this is uh, Filippo Rizzo here. <clears throat> um, he was from here, from this area, San Michele di Gonzaria. And like when he, he sort of grew up, became a young adult, he left, he moved to Belgium and worked in restaurants, opened restaurants, had a little Italian restaurant that uh, he focused on natural wine and stuff back, I don't know, like 15, 18 years ago, something like that, like before natural wine was sort of a thing. Um, but he was, you know, he was there in um, Belgium, you know, like with a restaurant and like very proud of being a Sicilian and stuff. Um, met his wife, his wife is Belgian and, um, so, you know, sort of like lived there, had kids, but then he started to miss Sicily. And uh, so he decided he wanted to move back to Sicily and he bought this, uh, now this, this was a building that they were working on rebuilding. Uh, here's a picture of the inside of his winery, very small. So like, that's like, that's a small basket press. Like if I was here standing next to it, my head would be like this, this high up here. Um, it's, you know, so that, that's a one and a half liter water bottle there. Like it's not a, not a big winery. There was some, the other wall was like right over here. And there was some equipment along that wall. And then there was like another small wall room, like at the end of this hallway, the winery was basically sort of like an L shape of like, this long narrow room and then another like narrow room with some room to age wine in there. Um, so he moved, so Filippo moved back here. He bought this old sort of abandoned farm that had some olive trees on it. And his plan was to just make olive oil because olive trees are not that hard to take care of. Like you have to go and prune them periodically and you have to harvest the olives and press them but you don't have to be there all the time. You don't have to like constantly be there, like checking on them, like doing stuff like that. Like growing olives and making olive oil is relatively not labor intensive. So that was his plan, but there were a bunch of old vines on the property too, like these old vines here. <clears throat> uh, there were, I think it was mostly Neridavala. And so he decided to start like, you know, he loved wine. He'd been working with wine for a long time in Belgium. So he decided to start making some wine. And um, so when he had this restaurant in Belgium, he was buying wine from this wine distributor, Frank Cornelissen, and they got to be friends. And then Frank Cornelissen was you know, like on a trip to Sicily and discovered Mount Etna and was like, oh my God, Mount Etna is amazing. I have to move to Mount Etna. And so, um, so Frank moved to Mount Etna. So while Filippo was here working on, you know, his little olive farm, Frank was over on Mount Etna starting to make wine up there. And so like, you know, just naturally, like he couldn't, like they were friends. So Filippo went and started, would go up and see Frank. And so Frank, uh, Filippo started working in Frank's winery and helping Frank, you know, make wine and try to figure out how to exist on Mount Etna and not like have his stuff stolen by the locals and things like that. So um, Filippo just sort of got sucked into making wine. So then he started making wine from these vines that he had. And then he started planting more vineyards and then he planted more vineyards. And Frank, Frank, like, Frank always wants to make things better. And part of wanting to make things better, he's always like, you know, Frank will like buy a piece of equipment 
and use it and then be like, oh, this would be better if it was different in this way. And he'll like find a way to change it or get like something slightly different. And so I think most of Filippo's wine, I think a lot of Filippo's winemaking equipment is stuff that came from Frank Cornelison at some point that like Frank had. And then Frank was like, ah, I don't want this anymore. Like, hey, Filippo, do you want this? And so uh, anyway, um, I think that these wines from Filippo, here's, so I, I did, I, of course, you know, I do a lot of running whenever I'm traveling. So I did a lot of running all around Filippo's lane and back and forth through the valley. This is a good sort of view. I was just running along and stopped and took this picture. That's a field that was probably planted for a uh, plowed for winter wheat because I was there in like late October. So they were probably just getting ready to plant that for winter wheat. This is the valley. Filippo's winery was off over to the right and it was running up over the hills um, on the other side. The soil here is all sort of like, this is light, airy, sort of eroded sand, sandstone soil. There was that, and then there was also a fair amount of clay. You can sort of see, this is more clayey soil here. Here's a picture. So this is from the deck of Filippo's house slash winery. The winery is down on the ground floor, living space upstairs. Um, that's Mount Etna right there. So uh, it's like, a couple hours away, I want to say, something like that. Um, so I'm trying to remember, maybe it was like an hour and a half drive, something. It wasn't too bad. So it was totally easy for like Filippo to get up there to Mount Etna to go see Frank, do stuff like that. And this is also like, this is what the countryside looks like down there. It's, it's these rolling hills, you know, everything, uh, not everything is planted uh, because the it, there is not the population that there used to be here. A lot of people have moved away, but um, you know all the land has been worked at one point or another. That is uh, so. Filippo bought this land here. These are his vineyards down there, and then he had bought some more land to add on to it. I think those might be his olive trees. There were more olive trees behind the house here. Um, and then he had just bought this, that building that they were working on and the picture of Filippo in front of the sandstone outcropping. That's the sandstone outcropping over there. When I was there, Filippo had just bought that. I forget, I wanna say it was like five hectares, six hectares, something like that. Um, that sandstone outcropping was completely covered with prick, prickly pear cactuses, Ficadindia, that like these down here that you can see that he was <clears throat> sort of, cutting back, trying to get to be more manageable. And then he was going to farm those. Uh, there were olive trees that he was going to start like farming. And then he was going to start planting some more vines over here too, so he could make more wine. <clears throat> um, what did I miss? Have I talked to Frank since the volcano eruptions? Uh, I haven't talked to him. I've seen stuff that he's posted online and that other people have posted everything that I've seen, like people post about the eruptions. Nobody seems to be particularly terribly worried about it. Um, I don't think that you can be that close to like a really seriously actively erupting volcano and not be kind of worried about it because, you know, like it's a very active volcano and like it does, you know, you can't, you can't drive through the town of Solichiata where Frank is, or the town of Pasupiciaro next door, or um, Rondazzo around the corner. Like, you can't drive around that part of Mount Etna and not constantly drive by old lava flows. You know, like there it happens, but um, it doesn't happen all the time. And it is a fact of life living on Mount Etna. Like, there are constant little tremors and earthquakes and stuff like that. And Etna is constantly sort of erupting. Like. You know, it'll glow at night, it'll smoke, it'll, you know, there will be small eruptions. This is a bigger one. But at this point, I don't think it's actually threatening any vineyards or, or anything like that. <clears throat> and even when it does, it usually happens relatively slowly and you have enough time to get out of the way. So it's like, you might lose part of, like, like you might lose part of your vineyard, you know, and that would be terrible. But um, 
it's pr- I think it's pretty rare that anybody like really like dies from an eruption, you know, if they're not like way up there on the volcano up by one of the cauldrons or one of the vents, like people that are down here in the towns on the sides of Mount Etna, it's pretty rare that anybody actually dies from an eruption because usually you have plenty of time to get out of the way. Um, so at this point, I, I don't, I haven't seen anybody be too particularly worried about it. Um, Lamaresco Rosso. I don't know what the breakdown is in this. I think this is close to equal parts for Pado and Narodavola. I think it might be a little bit more Narodavola than, um, than for Pado. These were some of the prettiest wines. Like Filippo makes wine on a very small scale, as you could tell from his winery there. Um, it's very small scale winemaking. And he's a very like precise, intense, like follow through attention to detail kind of guy who's just sort of always on, always thinking about it, always thinking about things. Um, and his wines, his wines were the prettiest and most precise and like exciting and, and just like beautiful, but like pure and clean, expressive wines that I tasted while I was there in Sicily. And I asked him, you know, I asked him like why and how, like why are his wines so, so clean and pretty? And he sort of laughed about it and was like, I don't know. I, he was like, I think it's probably just because I live here in my winery. And so I like taste all of these things virtually every day. Like he's just always there checking in constantly to make sure that everything is right. And so if if one of the wines is like, as it's aging or it's fermenting, if it starts not quite going in the direction that he wants, he can react immediately by, you know, by like transferring it from one tank to another to take it off of the lees or to like aerate it a little bit or to stop aerating it to like stop doing punch downs or, you know, whatever, any one of those like little, little details that's not adding stuff to the wine that's not like you know doing some kind of like massive intervention just like little details changing his winemaking process a little bit to sort of like correct for whatever is happening that he doesn't really like so that it ends up being ends up going in the direction that he wants um but that said like these are natural wines he generally doesn't add sulfur to them. I think he may add sulfur to like particular wines if he feels like it really needs it. But in general, um, this is, uh, you know, this is a very, very natural wine. It smells, I feel like I can smell the Frappato more. I think it smells prettier. It's definitely grippier. This is, I mean, that's why I followed the other one with this. This is a more, a more concentrated, more structured wine with like more tannin, more acidity to it. Prune really like black, like wild cherry. It also has a really salty finish again. Like there's a real like salty saline thing that I, that I get on the finish that like lingers and comes back. It's thicker than the Piano Grillo was. Like I can just, I can feel the viscosity on my palate and looking at it in the glass, it sticks to the side of the glass significantly more and stains the glass a darker color. Uh, this is 2019. So it's a year younger than the other one as well, which should make it a little bit more, you know, a little tighter and a little, little, just all of the structure the acidity, tannin, all of it a little bit more 
aggressive, a little bit more prominent. It's more, I think really though, it's like the fruit is darker, but something about the flavor of the fruit really is kind of like raspberry to me. Like it's like dark, like black raspberry or something like that in the, in the mid palate there. Um, it's, uh, yeah, they're cool wines. And he's, Filippo is out in the middle of nowhere. There's no one else around here making wine. There's uh, there's really like not much around him. He's pretty much just like out there on his own. Now moving on to Mount Etna for the last one. Um, so next week I'm going to just do Mount Etna. Mount Etna, there's just a lot there to talk about and unpack and stuff. So I didn't want to just, um, I didn't want to, try to do Mount Etna and also do the rest of Sicily at the same time uh, today. But also it's, you know, it doesn't make sense to do Sicily without talking about Mount Etna. Uh, this is 2018 Etna Rosso. Um, it's mostly, it's mostly Norello Mascalese. It also has some Norello Cappuccio in it. And there's probably a little bit of other stuff in here. Um, because most of the vineyards on Etna are sort of kind of field blends. They're all pretty sort of at least a little bit mixed of different grape varieties. <clears throat> but Norella Mascalese is the dominant grape everywhere up there. Um, let's see. I don't know. I should really just talk about Mount Etna. So this winery, this is, uh, it's a brother and sister, Flavia and Giacomo, um, the Saline. Um, the, their family has been growing grapes and making wine for several generations. And they have, they have vineyards here on Etna. And then they actually also have vineyards over in the West in the Alcamo Valley over by Marsala there. Uh, and I think eventually I'll be getting some of those wines too, but their family had always sold these wines off in bulk. They were sort of making wine, but then just selling them off in bulk instead of like bottling it and trying to bring it to market themselves. So this is actually the very first vintage that they've done that. This is the very first, this is the first time that they've put wines in bottles, 2018. Um, yeah, so it's like, so it's, it's, it comes from, I, it's like two or three different contradas, sort of single vineyards around the area of Solichiata. So that's the same north east slope of Mount Etna where most of the serious winemaking happens on Etna. I'm going to go over here to uh, uh, the map of Sicily again. So so Mount Etna here, this whole, like this purple thing, like this is all Etna, you can make Etna DOC wine anywhere in here. But uh, down here, it's sometimes too hot. And then over here, it's really too like cold and windy and you get a lot of rain off of the ocean. Um, I went and I visited Salvo Foti's winery up here in Nilo. And it was crazy. I was there at his winery. Actually, I, well, I, you know, of course I went there and I got there early and I went for a run all around the town and like up and down through the hills and the vineyards. And, you know, it's like 2,500 feet above sea level. You're up on a mountain and it feels like you're up on a mountain, but the ocean is right there. The ocean is maybe a mile, maybe a like, maybe a mile away, something like that. And so even though I was up like 2,500 feet above sea level there, it smelled and felt like I was at like on the shore, like standing on the sand. It was like, I could smell the salt in the air and the air was like humid and heavy and sticky and stuff like that. Like, like I was right on the ocean. So over here in this area, it's 
hard to grow red grapes like Norella Mascalese and like really properly ripen them. So over in this area, it's more white grapes that are grown, Colorado, Zabiba, uh, Colorado, Caracante, and Minella. It's up in here. This is really where like the red wine production happens um, because you have Etna here and then you have the Nebrodi Mountains over here. So storms come in off of the like Tyrrhenian Sea and they hit the mountain and they kind of go up across here. And some like, mo like it's, they get plenty of rain Moisture comes up the valley here, up along the Alcantara River, um, but it's not like it's not just completely exposed to the ocean there. So it's a little bit more protected. They don't the storms aren't as bad. Um, so that's where most of the winemaking really is. And where they are, where this comes from, the Flavia, like Solichiata is right up in like here, right above. You go up to Linguolosa and then you turn left, and it's right over. In, in here and then Rondazzo is over there at the at the edge of it. Um, I think I opened, no, maybe I didn't even. Uh, I'm just gonna show you a bunch of good Mount Etna pictures. Uh, these are classic terraced vineyards up on Mount Etna. Um, actually, I should have. Those are Norella Mascalese vines. I actually should have some that are looking out more. Yeah. All right, so that's, this is Solichiata. <clears throat> you can see that volcanic soil down there. It's very fine. It's relatively light, um, but it's like mineral rich, but not super, super nutrient rich. And then you have all this like hard volcanic rock down underneath it that the vines roots have to work down through um, that keeps them from getting being too productive, but also provides plenty of water. And then down there you have the valley and the Alcantara River, and that's the Nebrodi mountain range over there. Um, and this is, like I said, this, so this is in Solichiata, like looking out across the valley. Another view that's looking a little bit more to the, uh, to the west there. Um, and this was in like, this was in like late October when I was there. So the vines harvest was over. The vines were just starting to lose their leaves. I think, I think a lot of those down there might be olive trees. There's also a lot of olive production up on the mountain. Um, Norella Mascalese is a grape that is indigenous to, uh, to Mount Etna. And it has a fair amount of like acidity and tannin and structure, but it's not super dark in color. There's more of that volcanic soil. There's another good picture of terraces and then a little bit of flat vineyard there. And so the ocean, the ocean is down that way. And you can see these clouds here that are coming up the valley from the ocean over there. And oh, yeah, there's a good. Here's a big piece of volcanic rock that's split apart, and there's an olive tree growing out of it. That's a that's a classic, classic Mount Etna. Like that's that's a good look at like what the soil is, what the what the rock is like. It's very it's it's hard, but it's also like porous and full of cracks and stuff like that. So the vines roots can work their way down through 
all of that. And uh, that's actually Frank Cornelison lives in, this is like the backside of his house. He lives over here in one of these houses. And then he is constructing a new like subterranean cellar down in here. So we were down there looking at it and stuff like that. And then this is all the earth that they're excavating from it. That's the Nebrodi mountain range over there. Mount Etna is sort of behind our back. And old olive trees. Let's, okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mount Etna. So full on Mount Etna next week is going to be a lot of fun. Um, but this is, okay. Yeah. I get a lot of cherry from this. I always get a lot of cherry from, uh, from Norello. And then you get those tannins like that come back on the finish. Yeah. Yeah, I chose this. I used this one for the class because to me, this is like really classic Mount Etna Norella Mascalese. It's like cherry, like ripe raspberry. It's pretty, but it also has like woodsy, savory sort of flavors in the mid palate and the finish that like that back up the um, the fruit. And the fruit flavors are like they're 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 pretty. They're like they're clean, but then it also has like tannin. It has like real tannic structure that sort of that underpins it. It's almost a tiny bit sort of like chocolatey. There's like, there's a savory sort of food thing going on to it. And then looking at it in the glass, it's pretty clear. It doesn't have like really deep purpley color. And there's a little bit of like an aromatic, like like herbal thing to the aroma too, like not spicy, but it's just like a little bit. It reminds me, I don't know. It reminds me of like, like the Mount Etna is just covered in all. It's like, it's like, like the French Garrigue, you know, of like from Southwest, from the Provence, like Mount Etna is just covered with all of these like dense plant, like plants, like bushes, shrubs, like chaparral that are all sort of like aromatic and have this this like spicy aromatic like plant smell to them and there's a little bit of that in the wine here this like musky spicy like aromatic thing along with the fruit along with the sort of like crushed cherry aroma yeah um cool so that's a that's a pretty like general overview of Sicily. Um, I think. Oh geez, I should go to. Here, screen share. Like you can kind of see from the map here. Like most of the wine production happens down here in the southeast over here in the West with Marsala. Like Marsala is, we didn't do Marsala today, but Marsala is like fortified sweet wine mostly. Um, there's more like still table wine made a little bit more inland here on the Northern side where it's a little bit more protected from the heat coming from Africa down there. And then there's some wine making like over here and a little bit along the coast down here, but there's not too much 
as far as I like have seen and been exposed to, there's not a ton, like a lot of like serious winemaking, like winemaking for export in the interior of Sicily. Most of it is happening around the coast down here, over here, and like over around Etna right now. Um, that may change in the future, but that's, that's where most of the winemaking is happening. So that's what I tried to cover today. And then um, next week, I will get into uh, specifically just Mount Etna because Mount Etna is crazy and has its own history and stuff like that. Um, let's see, question about, I can't scroll. There we go. Uh, it isn't a clear bottle. Um, the significance of the clear bottle is really only that, uh, so it's also, it's a liter bottle. So this is one liter of Etna Rosa, which is unusual. Um, the significance is really just that they're trying to have this be viewed, have, have like, you know, Amer have people in other countries, Americans, Germans, English, when they see this bottle be like, oh, cool. This is red wine from Mount Etna, but it's not like super expensive fancy wine this is like more accessible wine from mount etna um it's it's not inexpensive this is like 21 dollars wholesale per bottle but for wine from mount etna that's not too expensive like wine from mount etna is getting relatively expensive it's hard to farm on mount etna it's you know everything pretty much has to be a lot of it has to be done by hand or with like very small specialized tractors, stuff like that. Um, and uh, land has gotten expensive up there. Uh, so this is sort of an effort to have this be perceived as a wine that is not that fancy. And also because it's a liter bottle, you're getting a third more, you know, and they're, they're saving some money on the bottle and the shipping and everything and stuff like that. So it's really... I think it's an effort to make this not seem as expensive and fancy as a lot of other Etna red wines have gotten recently. And also because this is the first bottle, this is the first vintage they've done. Um, this is the first time they put wine in a bottle. And so they're trying to, it's a young, it's like they're young, they're a young brother and sister. They're trying to stand out and differentiate themselves. A lot of the other people making wine on Mount Etna, you have, some like people who are younger and passionate who are making wine like Eduardo Torres Acosta but in general the people making wine on Mount Etna uh have money like they're they're they have money and they have bought a wine like a vineyard on Mount Etna because they want to have a vineyard on Mount Etna um because at this point land is expensive and it's just, a, it's just, it's an expensive place to do business. Like it's hard to get stuff up, like to get to where the wineries are on Mount Etna up there on the Northeast slope. Um, you have to like, it's a lot of like little switchbacks up the mountain and stuff like getting heavy equipment and things up there is not easy. Um, I've run all up and down those roads and it's like, they're not great roads for anything other than like small cars really um there's a lot of places where like it like when opposing traffic comes along like someone has to like pull off and get out of the way um so anyway so i think they're trying this bottle because it's a clear glass bottle and everything and like and their label like they're trying to just differentiate themselves and be like we're not some fancy german guy who just bought a vineyard here um yeah you could absolutely this this has great structure. Like this is great, serious Mount Etna wine. That's why I used it today. You could drink this in 10 years or, or more. Like this is absolutely age-worthy wine. Um, you could totally hold on to this for a while and it would be great. It would get better and be, and be really interesting. Um, you know, this, this can be a, dis this can be a discussion of market economics in next week's Etna seminar. Um, how like the price of Etna wines has gone up and you have some people selling wines for, you know, a hundred dollars a bottle. And then you have other people still like making wine and selling it from the winery for like two euros per bottle, you know, or like you come and you fill up a jug and you pay like two euros per liter or something like that. Um, 
it is what it is. But uh, any other questions now while I'm here and I've covered, talked about Sicily for an hour and a half now. <clears throat> Anything else for me? Any questions? No, I'm good. When I, uh, I just wanted to say when I went down to Sicily uh, and I went to Ariana Occupinti's uh, winery, it was uh, such a treat. Her, a lot of her uh, uh, winery is deep red clay. It's very dense. Um, and when you went underground, you could see all of the fossils. Yeah. Uh, in the fall, uh, uh, in her neutral, uh, you know, oak barrels down uh, underground. Uh, I haven't, I mean, I would, I went there when she was just barely getting her first uh, Bianco uh, in, into rotation. And it was, we were tasting it out of the tank. It hadn't even finished yet. Uh, it was pretty phenomenal. It's unfortunate that you weren't able to be able to nassle her into this entire experience just because she's so, so highly allocated it's really hard yeah. to hold on to stuff and be able to to share it with others but her grillo we could get it for like three bottles for 10 euros like her like table grillo was just like everybody have some have more the uh, the, the tammy yeah 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 it was like open season, get on in here. Well, because there's a store called Tammy um, right. and you go there and get like three bottles that are for 10 euros at the time. Again, this was a while ago. Uh, the Euro is very different now, but, um, but yeah, no, it was, it was an incredible experience. And the wild fennel were like trees. Yeah. They, were as, they were as tall as my friend. Like we literally put her against them and they, she was overshadowed by these plants that yep. were uh, aggressively uh aromatic and everywhere so yeah, it you was, smell you smell them everywhere oh yeah no, it's everywhere it's everywhere so uh so the wild fennel is definitely a major component in the wines that it's not the black licorice that you get from northern italy italian wines it's that wild like light air ethereal it's Aerial. like yeah yeah it's very airy so thank you ned for yeah. having a place that's very near and dear to me yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. I can't wait to go back. Cool. All right. Thanks everybody. Thanks a lot for doing this. Thanks for uh, coming and tasting wines and um, I'll do this next week with Mount Etna. Bye.